Dance Boys, you can hear what he has to say. His name is Dance Boy, he thinks the world is all over. What up, Net fans? Nets boy here, bringing you latest in your Brooklyn Nets news. All right, so it's been a little over two weeks since my last Nets boy episode, um, in which the Nets played seven games, and during that stretch, they went three and four. Now, overall, that's kind of what I expected them to do during that stretch of games because they really had some rough games when they went on the West Coast trip, the last five. Um, they took care of business against the Hawks and the Wizards before they went on the West Coast trip, like like I said they had to do. Um, but then things just didn't work out when they went West. And look, it was a tough stretch, okay? Those were some really tough teams and tough games. I mean, they had a back-to-back -back with the second game in Denver against the defending champion Nuggets. That's just unfair. Like, you're you're going to the West Coast, then you're playing the back, so you got the time adjustment, then you're doing a back-to-back, -back, which is the second game is in the elevation of Colorado, like, in Denver? Like, what? How, how is that even allowed? Like, that's, that's some, some answers that I think, like, the NBA scheduling committee needs to, needs to address because who the hell thought of that would be fair for anybody? Like, Anyway, I digress. So the point is they had a really rough West Coast uh, stretch. And look, they went one and four on the West Coast. And, you know, with the teams that they played and, 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 and being a road trip, you kind of take a one and five stretch. But the reality is once they beat the Suns in Phoenix, the first game of the new big three with Kevin Durant, Bradley Beal, and Devin Booker. Once the Nets won that game, I was like, they got to win at least one more. And when you looked at the Warriors game, which, look, obviously Steph is Steph Curry is Steph Curry and Clay Thompson and, and so on and so forth. But that team has struggled so far this year. Draymond Green is, is suspended indefinitely for being Draymond Green. And so, like, you looked at that game, and you're like, that's a game the Nets can steal. No, no, Steph Curry wasn't going to let that happen. And then the following game after that, they got a game against the Jazz, a team that's the definition of mediocre. No, 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 Nets decided that they, weren't, that they were just going to let Horton Tucker go crazy and make all these ridiculous shots and just not play – you know, any defense and can get a damn rebound. So those two games, I really felt the Nets should have won at least one of those two, but they didn't play the way they should. They, they, they didn't execute the way they needed to. And a one and four stretch on the West Coast. And it's just very, very disappointing to see. But uh, the reality is, and I just kind of mentioned it, talking about that Jazz game, is that this team just can't play defense right now. I don't know exactly why. I have a couple of theories, and I'll touch upon a few of those theories in a second. But the reality is they can't play consistent defense. And, and I mean, they touched upon it at the broadcast. The Nets are 1-11, now 1-12, and, and they give up over 120 points. I mean, but 120 is loads of points. <laughs> so, like, but the, the reality is, like, like, this team is supposed to be built on defense. You've got players like Mikel Bridges, Nick Claxton, Joy Finney Smith, Royce O'Neal, right? These are all really good top level defensive players, yet the Nets are like in the bottom third in defensive efficiency. So something has to be a reason. And like I said, I'm not exactly sure what, but I do have a couple of ideas that might explain why this Nets team just can't play any defense. All right. So one of the theories I have of why this team can't play any damn defense is the pace in which they play. So the Nets have this very fast pace, 
shoot a lot of threes, push the tempo type of philosophy, right? Jock Vaughn always talks about, you know, not getting the ball stagnant and just keep pushing, pushing and trying to run. And that works, especially for this Nets team on the offensive side. But the problem with that is when you start pushing the tempo, you allow the other team to also play really fast. And sometimes that helps the other team become a good offensive team. And if you don't have a good transition defense, then that could become a problem. Now, I'm not saying the Nets shouldn't push the tempo, and I think they should. I think that's the most effective way for them to score, and they're very good at it. And I'm not saying they shouldn't shoot a lot of threes. I'm just saying this could be a reason why this team is struggling on the defensive end, and they have to figure out how to minimize the transition points and minimize the turnovers because the turnovers happen a lot when you push the tempo. And especially in the Jazz game, the Nets were turning the ball over left and right. So if you can push the tempo and shoot a lot of threes like the Nets want to do, but you control the turnovers and therefore control the transition defense, then perhaps the defense would be a little bit better and the Nets wouldn't be as big of a joke. But that's something that I've noticed. It's just just that fast-paced speed and tempo. is It, it allows the other team to just – also benefiting and, and score a lot. So that's one thing I came up with and one theory they have for why this Nets team uh, is, is struggling defensively. Now, the second theory I have about this Nets team and its poor defense is the simple fact that they're just not healthy. I mean, they're still missing so many key players. You know, Dorian Finney-Smith missed a lot of time. He just came back for the Utah game. Uh, Dennis Smith Jr., who we all know how good of a defender he is, him and Lonnie Walker weren't, didn't even go on the West Coast trip. Um, you know, there's always a player that seems to be missing a significance in this Nets rotation. I mean, should I even talk about Ben the Useless Simmons? I mean, I guess I should because we do know what type of player he is defensively. He's a great defensive player. So his absence is surely, you know, noticeable, I, I, I guess. I don't know. Is his absence actually noticeable? I mean – He's a phantom player, so maybe not necessarily him. But we can't all agree that if he was playing, the defense would be better. But, you know, when you have a bunch of players in and out of the rotation, the defensive chemistry is just not there. And I touched upon this before. You could have loads of great individual defenders on a team, but if they don't know how to communicate, if they don't know the right assignment, if they're not sure when they're supposed to switch or when they're supposed to rotate and who's got what, you know, the defense is going to struggle. You know, basketball is a very team-oriented sport on the defensive end. You know, it, you know, your defenses need to plead together. And I've mentioned this before, just like a chain link fence, it just takes one weak link to snap that fence and snap it. And that's something that happens when you have a bunch of players that are unfamiliar with each other. So... That, I think, is a big, big reason why this team struggles defensively. If they can get healthy and start developing more continuity in the rotation, maybe we'll start seeing this Nets team play a little bit better defensively because they've got the personnel to be a good defensive team. But if everyone gets hurt all the time, what good is it? So that's the other or another reason why I think this team is struggling defensively. Next. No. Nets boy has one more theory of why the Nets have really struggled defensively. And it should come as a surprise to no one that it is Nets boy's new favorite target, Cam Thomas. Now, look, I'm going to start off this rant the way I start off with all my Cam Thomas rants. Cam Thomas is a gifted scorer. One of the best scorers I've seen in a while. His, his ability to take and make tough shots, it, it's up there with the best. Very impressive. He can give you 40 points like that, and it's, 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 it's a gift. But the reality is, I've said it so many times in previous episodes, and I will stand firmly behind it. The guy plays losing basketball. 
And I don't think it is a coincidence that the games that Cam Thomas plays the best, the Nets tend to lose. Scores 41 points against the, the uh, uh, Warriors, Nets lose. Has a good game, scores 32 against the Jazz, Nets lose. Has a pretty poor game against the Suns. I think he scored 17. He kind of figured out halfway through. But Mikel Bridges had a good game, and Cam Johnson had a good game, and the whole team had a good game. Dinwiddie had a good game. Making big shots down the stretch. <gasps> the Nets won! What? Why? Because Cam plays losing basketball. If Cam Thomas is the focus of your offense and is the main guy jacking up 25 shots a game, you will lose. And a big thing behind that, once again, is the defensive side of the ball. Cam can't play any defense. And that's not saying that he's not trying to. He's just not good at it. He has poor lateral quickness, poor anticipation, late rotations, and just simply can't do it. And look, that doesn't mean he can't figure it out because, like I just mentioned, defense is kind of more of a team thing. Team defense is better than individual defense. And Cam could become a solid team, def team defender. But at this point, he's the weak link. And the more he's out there, because of how gifted of a scorer he is, the weaker the defense is going to be. I've said this from the beginning. I think Cam needs to be in a six-man role. He should play 22 to 25 minutes a game coming off the bench being instant offense. Put him out there at, you know, 10 minutes, three, 10, you know, eight minute spurts, three, eight minute spurts, boom, boom, boom. And let him get you 20 points in those, in those, in those, you know, spurts of time that he's out there. Let him be the focus there. That way he's going up against the second unit most of the time, which aren't, don't have nearly as good of defenders and also not nearly as good of offensive players. So his little weaknesses defensively won't hurt the team as much. But no, no, we have to start Cam because, you know, he'll go one on five and make a tough fadeaway jump shot and he'll make it. And we all applaud him because it's great basketball as Mikael Bridges and Cam Johnson are just standing there wide open in the, in the corner waiting to shoot a three. And, but we, we're not, we're just going to keep, we completely disregard that because Cam Thomas happened to make a tough floating jump shot over two defenders. It's just, it all comes full circle. It all comes full circle. And I, the reality is, I don't think it's going to change. I think everyone is jumping on this Cam Thomas hype, and it's going to ultimately be the downfall of the Nets at this point. I I, I believe so. I, I really, really do. Guy can't play defense, and he's a black hole. There's no rotation. There's no movement. He's one-dimensional. I mean, you see how often teams blitz him on the defense and he turns the ball over? That is another factor on the defensive side. If you turn the ball over, I just touched upon it before, then you can't get back defensively. Live ball turnovers are awful. And look it up. There's a lot of live ball turnovers that the Nets have, especially when Cam Thomas is an idiot. And he takes a dumb shot and he misses and it's a long rebound and the defense gets it and they can push the tempo. It all comes full circle. Your offensive efficiency can impact your defensive efficiency. If you're doing poor offense, it will translate to poor defense. It's just a fact. And also on the flip side, if you play good defense, it can translate to good offense. So it kind of goes both ways. But it's just... It's just a big thing I've noticed. Now, look, I am nitpicking a little bit, I, you know, because the reality is, I, and I've touched upon this in other episodes, the Nets do need Cam Thomas. I'm not trying to say the guy has no value. I'm not trying to say it's an addition by subtraction situation. I'm just saying as long as Cam Thomas is playing the way he's playing and he's going to be as involved as he is, the Nets are going to struggle defensively and they will have to cover it in other ways. And that doesn't mean that you can't 
cover in other ways. I mean, there's a lot of gifted players in the NBA that aren't great defensive players. I mean, Trey Young comes to mind, right? He's notoriously known to be a poor defensive player, yet the Hawks have won some games, though. Actually, wait, the Hawks are like five games under 500. So, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe I'm on to something here. If you got these poor defenders out there, the, the weak link, it, they're going to struggle. But, I mean, Luka Doncic is not considered to be a great defender. The Mavs are doing well. But, but it all depends on the rest of the team. And, and take Cam Thomas and his defensive inefficiencies and take the injuries and take the pace. It all swirls together and all becomes one giant concoction of defensive crap. There you go. There you have it. Nets boy figured it out. It's all three things. And that is why this Nets team is struggling defensively. Go figure. All right, there you have it. Those are my theories of why this Nets team is struggling defensively. Um, before we wrap up this episode, let's look at the next couple games for the Nets. Let's see if we can try to figure out if this team can figure out how to play defense and maybe win some of these games. So the next game they have, they fly back east, and they have an always fun matchup against our good friends, the New York Knicks. That is Wednesday. That is a game that... I want to believe the Nets are going to win. I mean, the, the Knicks are clearly the better team. They have more talent. But something tells me the Nets are going to win that game. But the reality is they are also flying back from the East, from the, excuse me, the West Coast. So that has to play into it. You know what? We'll chalk that one up to a loss. I feel like deep down somehow they're going to win, but... Let's assume they're going to lose that game. Then they got the Nuggets again. They'll probably lose that one. Before they have what I'm going to say is a critical set of games, a home-at-home against the Pistons. The Pistons, which, by the way, are currently on a 24-game losing streak. So we'll see. Personally, I hope they snap the losing streak before they play the Nets because I can see the Pistons, you know, breaking the streak against the Nets because, you know, why the hell not? Go figure, right? But the Nets have to win those games. They've, they've got to win those games. You know, they got Christmas in between. What a screwy home and home. They play on the 23rd in Brooklyn. They then travel, have Christmas, you know, and then play in Detroit on the 26th. Uh, this scheduling, the schedule, like I said, we t- what are these scheduling committee doing to the Nets? That's screwy as hell. I, never mind. I don't know. I don't know. Then they got the Bucks. That'll be a loss. And then they have the Wizards, Thunder, and Pelicans. So this is, once again, not an easy stretch of games. The Wizards and the two Pistons games are the only games that you would say the Nets should win. So three of the next... One, two, three, four, five, six, six games, seven, eight, if you want to go into the Pelicans and Thunder. Three of the next eight games, that's not going to be good. But that's what I'm expecting. This is why the Nets needed to try to steal some of these other games, whether it's against the Warriors or the Jazz. And it's also why I really feel like they do have to beat the Knicks when they come back on Wednesday because those those stretches of games, the Bucks, the 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 Nuggets, the Thunder, the Pelicans, these are good teams that the Nets may not be able to beat. I don't know. I don't know. Things are starting to really get bleak, in my opinion, for this Nets team. They're 13 and 13, and I'm just I'm just seeing the spiral. I'm seeing the spiral starting. And maybe it's just me being the pessimistic person I am, but I don't know if it's gonna stop. But let me know what you guys think about everything. If you agree with me of my three theories of why this Nets team struggled defensively and uh, what you think could happen with this team moving forward. So keep your eyes open to the next Nets boy. Um, Until then, this is Nets boy wishing everyone a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays because I know I will not be doing an episode until after Christmas. So until then, heck, I might even say uh, Happy, you know, Happy New Year's. I mean, I don't know. I, I want to believe I'll be able to do an episode before New Year's, but 
reality is you never know. So I'll just say, you know, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year's, Happy Holidays, just in case. And until the next Nets boy, this is Nets boy. Sign it off. Well, no.